give Pete a chance. Um, and as I say, I'm Jenny Sharman, Peatland Restoration Officer for the Yorkshire Peat Partnership. So what is the Yorkshire Peat Partnership? Well, we've set about uh, on a mission to restore all of Yorkshire's upland peatlands. So all of the blanket bog that we have in Yorkshire. And there's a good oh, sort of 95,000 hectares of it. Um, so we have got this wonderful partnership as well. We're an umbrella organization. All of these uh, organizations that you see here support us in one way or another, be it funding, be it advice. Um, uh, and you know we couldn't do it without them. So thank you very much to all of them. Um, so, so far since we began in 2009, we've managed to make a start on about 31,000 hectares of restoration. Um, and as I say, that's we've still got a, a fair way to go. But that uh, 31,000 has involved a huge amount of work. So it's been 140 hectares of bare peat that we've actually revegetated. Uh, it's been 3,250 kilometers of eroded hags, which you see here, that we will have reprofiled and revegetated as well. It would be 2,100 kilometers of grips and gullies like this one that we will have blocked, just holding back all of that water that's washing down them. And as I say, unfortunately, there is still a long way to go. So another 64, mere 64,000 hectares to go. Um, but I'm actually working for a project called Pennine Peat Life, which is, uh, we're four years in, we've got about another year left to go. And uh, most of our restoration work has actually finished now. And the, one of the main kind of ambitions of the project was to try to restore 1,353 hectares across uh, the North Pennines AONB, Yorkshire Dales National Park and Nidderdale AONB and the Forest of Boland. So it was this wonderful collaborative multi-partnership. And I have been in charge of seven sites, managing seven sites across Yorkshire Dales and North Pennines AONB that total about 650 hectares altogether. And I'm today just going to focus on a, three of those to try to give you an idea of what causes damage to peatlands in Yorkshire and also the impact that that has probably had on those sites and to Yorkshire in general and and then to go into the restoration side of it uh, for you to get a, a taste of actually what's involved in restoration the enormous task that there is and it should then give you some idea about our ambition, which is to do 64,000 hectares by 2035. So a massive ambition, um, which you'll really appreciate, I think, I hope at the end of this. So um, on my very first day out on site, when I was uh, a real rookie um, about six, seven years ago now, and um, I was an assistant and the project officer I was with was driving between, we were driving between Skipton and Hawes, and she suddenly pointed out the window at this site that just looked like a battlefield, you know, just was so badly damaged. And she said, you know, this is actually one of the worst sites that we have in the Yorkshire Dales, and one day we're going to have to tackle it. Um, and I, I kind of looked out the window at this sort of dreadful sight of a broken landscape just bare peat stretching for as far as the eye could see. And I thought to myself, oh, well, I pity the poor so-and-so that has to do that. Mm, you, know, you can guess it, I am the poor so-and-so. <laughs> and the site is Fleet Moss. Um, it's actually become a site that I love. Um, it's taught me so much. It's it's given me so much hope as well for the future of peatlands in this country because peatlands actually respond incredibly well to restoration if you do it right so yeah um fleet moss let's talk a little bit more about fleet moss so it sits between two catchments which actually makes it very influential to the water systems in the area so first of all 
It drains off into Bardale Beck to the north and down into Semmer Water and then eventually into the Ewer. So it will have an impact on that very big river. To the south, uh, it drains through Outer Shore Beck and then into the Wharf. So another really significant catchment. Now, the bare peat on this site is so bad that you can actually see it from outer space. So you see within that little red circle, there's a blob of brown. That is fleet moss. So going in closer, there it is again. All of that is bare peat, that brown. It's just massive. It's so badly eroded. Because of the enormity of the task, we actually divided up the land into three. So we had Fleet Moss as our kind of main site in the middle. We have, Bard we have um, Blaybury Moor to the east and Outer Shore to the west. And within this, we have got six kilometers worth of grips. We've got 13 kilometers of gullies. We've got 19 and a half kilometers of hags, and we've got 12 hectares of bare peat. You can see there's very, very little land in there that hasn't got some kind of erosion feature. So really, really damaged site. Now, if we look at some of the causes of that damage, um, one of the things that you'll notice straight away, this is an aerial of fleet moss, are those lines which are cut into the landscape. And they're ditches, they're irrigation ditches known as grips. And all across Yorkshire, post-World War II, the government encouraged farmers to actually put these ditches into the land to drain it so that we could get more sheep up here. As I say, it's post-World War II, we wanted more food in the country, so this is, this is what they thought would be best to do. So the farmers all went out, 60s, 70s, and uh, put in these ditches, which there's thousands of kilometers worth across Yorkshire. And they did exactly what they said on the tin, and they drained the land, they drained the peat, not realizing the consequences of that, because straight away, once the peat started to dry, it just became really susceptible to erosion and the vegetation changed as well. And just as this kind of double whammy, you bring the sheep onto the land and their hooves constantly grinding away at the ground and their mouths pulling away at the vegetation also began to clear that protective top layer of vegetation. And you just very quickly actually ended up with land that looked a bit like this and the erosion was just phenomenal. And it just began to pour off the land, all of this peat just being ripped up. So one thing though, that I began to realize as I uh, spent more time on Fleet Moss was that the parish boundary, which runs straight through the middle of it. So we've got Richmondshire to the North and we've got Craven District Council to the South. And I was looking at this boundary uh, on aerials and it made me realize something. So on this map, if you have a look here, the red is all the bare peat area. Now put in the parish boundary and look where it goes. It's almost like an epicenter for a lot of that bare peat. So that started my little investigative brain churning and I was thinking, oh, oh, oh my, that's really interesting. And of course, in years gone by, people used to walk the parish boundary. It used to be something that they would do as a ritual and probably also just getting from A to B. And peat is so vulnerable or the vegetation on it is so vulnerable to trampling that in places where you have this sort of constant passage of, of feet, whatever it might be, animals or humans, um, a path starts to develop. And you can see here between these two posts, in the distance, there is another post, that line that leads to those posts, that is the parish boundary. So I began to think that there could be something in this. But also, when you then again dial in the sheep, and you know how sheep behave, they will push up to the end edges of fences, 
and they'll walk along them. They'll go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards over their kind of ground, their territory. And as I say, sort of walking along the boundary edge. And so these gullies became deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, and the other thing is that you can see in this picture, all of the kind of little paths that were being created by the hooves of sheep. That's my theory. Anyway, so all of that in that kind of uh, bottom right hand corner, all those little pathways, I do think were sheep that were wandering around on the moor. And if, if I'm right, just look at how much damage as well that, that just that would have done. All that water as well then, just being eroding in those pathways and the grips that you see there as well in the distance, they would have been contributing to it as well because huge amounts of water would be pouring off those grips and going into the rest of the site. And as the slopes got steeper and steeper, the gullies got deeper and deeper. And on Fleet Moss, we have gullies that run up to four meters high um, and really wide. And if you know that peat takes one millimeter a year to grow. So this, which is about four meters, it represents 4,000 years of peat. And it's now, all of that peat has eroded away. It's just been washed away in such a short space of time. So yeah, sad. So that's fleet moss and um, there it is looking all yellow and orange whatever on the on the left there and the second site that I want to talk about is a site called state moss which is as the crow flies actually very close to fleet moss on the right there. Now state moss drains into Bishopdale uh, which then also goes into the ewer so again it influences a very large catchment and if you look at it on an aerial, you'll see again those brown bits, that is bare peat. So again, the majority of that site, if you look at it, is eroded. And in fact, the green bits that you see are actually grass on limestone. So it's not even peat, the green bits. So basically all of the peat is pretty much damaged. <clears throat> so state moss is also 160 hectares. And as I say, the, the it's very similar to fleet moss in terms of the depth of some of the gullies, although they are they are a bit narrower. Um, but again, the water has just poured down there for some reason and just drained it all, eroded all of that peat away. And if you look at sort of top right hand corner of, of the slide there, there's sort of funny mounds that you can see, and that's known as dendritic erosion. And again, it's possible that that could have been driven by sheep, or it may just be the topography um, that the, the lines of uh, water would be following the topography of the land and just creating those erosion features. So what caused all this on state moss? Well, it's a little tricky to answer that question. It could be sheep, it, it could be something else. One of the things though that I did begin to notice or was on the aerials. You could see this area of which looked like just flat bare peat, but a little bit of an odd color, which uh, was in the middle of the site. And I learned from archeologists that this is most likely to have been a dressing floor in the lead mining industry. So dressing floor was where, when they brought all of the rocks up from under the ground, they would then sort out what was ore and what was just rock. And they used this big space in order to do that. Um, so I then looked a bit further and realized that this piece of bare peat was incredibly close to a lot of eroded land that you can see just to the right of it there. And again, that made me start thinking, has that area, has the mining in this area actually influenced what's gone on on this site? Has it caused the erosion in some way? If you look further up there, you can see that those little gray blobs are in fact mine shafts. So there's a complex of eight mine shafts on state moss. And I also learned that the fire would have been used or quite possibly have been used in the whole mining process 
Um, so it's possible that a fire got out of hand on this site and caused all of that erosion that you see and started just kicked off this whole process. So as soon as fire sweeps through, it takes off that vegetation layer, that protective layer. So in the same way that draining it and, and the sheep eroding it to pulling out the vegetation, fire does that incredibly quickly. And it has the impact of drying out the peat as well. So it loses its ability to hold water. So the vegetation dies. Um, and that again, just makes it really susceptible to rainfall and, and all the different weather conditions that we get on the moors. So that was the theory that I was beginning to form in my head. Um, and if, if you take that as well, what you can also see is that as that bare peat area grew, it started to create channels of water. So the, it's a bit sloping there, where, where the sort of epicenter of bare peat is, it's on relatively flat land, but it then starts to slope away. So what you can see is that there's a big gully that all of this area is starting to erode and feed into, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you go along it. The other thing that I noticed was that just down here, there's a tiny little tarn, but if you look closely, that area is actually, it's flat and you can see it's a slightly different color and that's because it's got quite a lot of sphagnum in it. But my theory there is that this used to be a very big tarn and that for, because this massive gully was forming just to the north of it, this water started to drain and it drained into that gully. So we lost all that water that was being stored there, that beautiful pool that would have been there in the past. So, and this, because of all of that water coming down, masses and masses of water, it just started to erode away, erode away, erode away, and this huge gully started to form. So you can see it a bit better here. And you can actually see the sort of lighter color, which it's down to rock, it's down to the mineral layer. So all of that peat has gone. And there's your tarn area, um, which goes off down straight into that gully, as you can see, drains straight down there. And that, that other line is where the, it's coming from the dressing floor. So again, as I say, all of that water that's pouring off from the top bit of peat and all of it coming down from the tarn is just careering down slope and gouging out gullies as it goes. And this is that gully. So it is a good four meters high. Um, and as I say, just you can imagine in the past, all of that would have been full of peat. So all of that has just disappeared. And with it, all of the carbon that was stored in there and also, if you can imagine all of that peat ending up in our rivers and streams, uh, not, not great. So that was my theory on state moss. And the last little site that I wanted to talk to you about is called East Gill. And it's a tiny little fella, uh, sits just above Angram Reservoir, um, which it also drains into. And it's only a little 10 hectare site but it packs a punch. <laughs> um, so most of that, the 10 hectares is actually eroded and bare peat. Um, again, not entirely sure what might have caused it. It's, uh, it's possible that it was sheep, but it's, there's another interesting thing in the area that I would like to talk about as well. And that's this rather sad fact that Aeroplanes have a lot of aeroplanes have crashed in the area. It's very high and it tends to get completely engulfed in fog and mist. And particularly during World War II, a number of aeroplanes crashed into these hills. This is the remains of, of one aeroplane. This is the fuselage, I believe. Um, now, what some of the stories that you hear from people who witnessed this said that fires started and they burnt for months, months and uh, over a massive area as well. And nobody could do anything to put them out. Um, and 
they only they only ended up going out because we started to get rain sort of three months in so and they did a huge amount of damage up there um, as I say just they would have just stripped the vegetation and and created all of that bare peat that would then be very very erodible the other thing is that in some areas actually you don't have any vegetation coming back in these areas where you had these plane crashes and I think that that could be because of the engine fuel or something that chemical something that has has meant that the peat has become so damaged that it cannot support life. So those are some of the reasons why we might be getting uh, so our peatlands are so damaged in Yorkshire and as you can tell they all unfortunately start uh, with a human interaction in some way or shape or form. Um, and so the first thing is it's either going to be your, your drainage, it's going to be the vegetation loss through fire um, or overgrazing, um, all of these factors which then create these massive hags and these huge enormous gullies. And if you think again about the amount of land that 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 is damaged and all of the species that would have depended on that land for their survival uh, they would have definitely been impacted by all of this now it's really difficult for me to be specific about those three sites or any of our sites actually as to what we've lost and over time uh, due to that damage but I can make a very kind of educated guess in terms of what I know, how, what peatlands support, what healthy bogs support, and also looking at this general decline of species in our country. So those of you who saw my talk, my first talk would, would remember, I think that um, we didn't always have peatlands in Yorkshire. They started about five to 6,000 years ago when the climate changed, it become, became much warmer and wetter. And the reason why that's significant is that if you look at this picture on these flat lands, they became very, very waterlogged by all of this extra rainfall and the warmth as well. And it created a really acidic environment which attracted species that love acidic environments. So you've got your uh, cotton grasses that you see in the picture there. And to the left, you've got the, that very bright green, which is sphagnum, bog moss. And those are the species that would start to grow on here. And it's actually those species that create the peat. Because of these waterlogged conditions, they decay incredibly slowly. There's no oxygen, there's too much water, and they just decompose incredibly slowly. And sphagnum itself is very acidic, so it also decomposes incredibly slowly. And it's that, that living matter that creates the peat. So if you think that when we get rid of all of that vegetation, we're effectively stopping the formation of peat. So that is for certain what's happened on my sites, that peat in the majority of the areas has stopped forming. It's actually being destroyed. So sphagnum, this is the key species really that we want on our bogs. It's the creator of peat. It's the creator of a lot of the acidity that a lot of the other species need to, to stay alive. So without it, it has this sort of uh, cascade effect on a lot of other species. So as well as the sphagnums disappearing because it's no longer waterlogged, you're also going to be getting other species disappearing. Fire. Now, fire does damage sphagnums. Um, most particularly, there is a species called sphagnum austini. And sphagnum austini, or austini, has disappeared from England. It used to be really prevalent. We can tell from records in the peat that it actually formed a lot of the peat that we had um, years and years ago, but it's completely gone now in England. And people believe that it is because of fire, the impact of fire, it is very, very sensitive to fire. So we will be losing species as a result of that. 
Then you've got your cotton grasses, your um, sundews, you've got your cranberries. All of these are dependent again on that acidity. They're dependent on the waterlogged uh, nature of bogs. So again, once sphagnums go, once that vegetation cover goes, the water that it dries and drains, these species will all start to diminish. So again, I think this is really, really likely on my sites. Fleet moss in particular, it's quite hard to find uh, lawns of sphagnum, which you would have had there in the past. So those species have gone and been replaced by this. So as you can see, just a real lack of diversity. There's, there's nothing really there. And it's just constantly being subjected to erosion. So more and more of that vegetation being torn up and disappearing. And not only that, but all of the carbon that was stored as that plant material um, and covered with the vegetation on the top is now being exposed to oxygen and it's decomposing and decaying and it creates this carbon that goes up into the atmosphere and contributes to climate change. And that is massive, massive, massive. So, um, you know, there's, this, there's a, a, a stat that, first of all, um, the amount of carbon that's being released in the UK is equivalent from peatlands is equivalent to what's being, well, actually, sorry, not equivalent, it's more than what's being released by oil refineries in this country. So there is a huge amount of carbon that's being lost. Um, and when peatlands are healthy and in good condition, they store more carbon in the UK than all of Germany and France's forests put together. So, you know, that's, that's how important they are at storing carbon. But obviously when they're damaged, then it just, it kind of, it goes really from bad to worse. Um, this is fleet moss and outer shore as seen from the air. Um, and you, you can see, I mean, it just looks like it's such a hopeless situation. But when you then destroy the plants, you're clearly destroying the habitat that so many other species relish. So you have your dragonflies and damselflies that love the bog pools, they really do. And then you get quite a lot of dragonflies that actually, they depend on peatlands for their survival. Similarly, your crane flies and your crane flies provide not only are, are they sort of living on this land, they're also providing so much food for so many other species as well that enjoy eating them. You've got beautiful things like your emperor moth and your large heath butterfly. And all of these species I can imagine will have gone down astronomically on the sites that you've seen pictures of that I've shown you. Um, there's no way that, that these species could have thrived in those environments. As I mentioned, the crane flies and so many birds depend on them for su their survival. They also depend on uh, the peatlands for breeding on. So you've got your curlews, your dunlins, lapwings, golden plover, all of them are in danger. They're in decline and although peatlands may not be the only reason or the damage in peatlands be the only reason, I can well imagine that on somewhere like Fleet Moss, a hundred years ago, we would have had flocks of golden plover. I rarely see one or two nowadays. So I'm pretty sure that that's a consequence um, of what's been going on up there. Reptiles as well, you've got common lizards, you've got adders. I've never seen an adder on my sites ever. Um, I've seen them elsewhere, but not on my sites. Um, amphibians, uh, you've got your raptors who uh, really depend a lot again on peatlands for their hunting ground and also for breeding. So the short-eared owl, uh, we do have a short-eared owl on fleet moss, but um, yeah. I, I would love to see these creatures just all over Yorkshire. It would be wonderful. So looking then beyond all of the, the, the wildlife that, that depends on these peatlands and start to look at ourselves, at humans and how we interact with peatlands. What do they mean to us? 
Well, I know for me that they're, 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 they provide a tranquility, they provide a beauty, they provide a space where I can nourish myself, I guess. And so it's, I think they do help in terms of uh, mental health and well-being, you know, the great outdoors. But really, if you're going to be spending time in something like this, I think your mental health and well-being may not be as nourished. <laughs> so that that is one aspect as well that I think we we run the risk of losing. The other thing is that peatlands actually they're like nature's reservoir. They provide seventy percent of our drinking water, and I'll just give you a really crazy fact. Uh, 630,000 Olympic sized swimming pools of water are drunk every year of water that comes from peatlands. So that is how significant they are. And if they diminished in any way, we would lose our water security, I would imagine. So again, you know, if you think again about those sites that you've seen and all the water that was pouring off them, how much water have we actually lost? how much of that reservoir has gone. Staying on the water theme as well. So you saw again from those pictures that in, on an eroded surface, water moves so fast. There's nothing to slow it down. There's no, there's no ve vegetation that actually the surface roughness of the vegetation, which slows down all the water, the runoff from rain, but also the sphagnum itself. Now sphagnum can hold 20 times its weight in water. So it absorbs quite a lot of the rainfall. And when you lose that capability and you have this sort of mass of water that's pouring off down the hills, you will be contributing in some way to flash flooding. So this is the wharf having a, a flash flood. Um, and I'm not saying that everything is down to the peatlands, but it will certainly be contributing. And you think again about those, those um, catchments that I mentioned, so the wharf, uh, the Ewer, going down from the Ewer and into the Ouse, and all of those cities and towns, Alt, Otley, Ilkley, York, Tadcaster, that suffer from flooding. And it will all begin and be influenced in some measure up on the peatlands. This is a direct impact of Fleet Moss. It's, it's down uh, in the valley, just below Fleet Moss in Marset. And the floods that have been, they, they're getting more and more regular down there. And it's not only the flooding, but the power of the water actually rips up the tracks, the roads that are there. And it deposits huge amounts of uh, boulders and rocks and sediment down in the fields. Um, so that's just one site and the impact that that can have locally. So just one last thing to think about in terms of what may have been lost on some of these sites with all of that erosion, and that's an archaeological record. So peat, as you probably know, can, because of its acidity, it, it can preserve everything from bodies to butter um, and here to trees. These remains were at the bottom of a, again, a four metre deep gully and were being exposed because of the erosion. So they are probably 4,000, 5,000 year old pieces of tree that are now being exposed and will be decomposing as a result. So all of that history is also being lost on those sites. So that brings me to restoration. Hopefully you'll, you'll feel now that restoration is actually incredibly important and we really need to be getting on with it. So for us, it starts with a lot of survey work in all weathers. <laughs> um, so sometimes it's like this and very rarely it's like this. Um, and what it is, is that we actually have to walk these sites, we walk transects on them, and every 100 metres we take a peat depth using peat poles like you see the gentleman in red there holding. And uh, in addition to the, the peat depths, we'll be looking at vegetation in each of these areas, 
every time we cross an erosion feature we'll be we'll be logging it how deep is the gully how wide is it does it go all the way down to stone uh, is it vegetated and all of that information will help feed a uh, feeder a restoration plan which we can then put together so on state moss what we discovered and we mapped was all of these which are hags all of this which are all the gullies and then all of the bare peat as well so you really can get an idea there of how damaged again this site is and as I mentioned before, most of the green area that you see, most of the areas where there is no feature, that's because it's on limestone. So, and there's no peat there. So from the perspective of restoration, um, we began restoration on state moss uh, in 2018. It took us about six months from beginning to end, although we did actually have little bits over the next sort of couple of years that we kept coming back to do. Um, Fleet Moss, we, uh, sorry, East Gill, because it's much smaller, only took about four months. Fleet Moss, on the other hand, has taken three years. <laughs> and that's pretty intense restoration work. And we still haven't really finished. We're going to be going back later this year uh, with funding from Garfield Western Foundation and the Environment Agency. So, but on that, actually, when I talk about restoration, it's not like we're, we're done and dusted. We've done state moss, that's fine, it's restored. It isn't, we've just started the process. So every time we have to keep going back to these sites, particularly the most damaged ones. So it's a very long drawn out process. But I have to say, the results are magnificent and it happens so quickly. So this is the gully on state moss that I showed you earlier in, in the talk, the one that drained from the dressing floor and went shooting off down, creating that very, very deep gully that you saw. And we've been using coir logs, which you'll see in the foreground. And there's also buns, which we've made out of peat. And all of that has helped hold back all of that water and in doing so it's allowed all these cotton grasses you, you see there the brown that's in the water to come back as well as sphagnum so we're getting lovely pools of sphagnum coming back and I'm going to show you a video which will give you a much greater idea of what the challenges are when it comes to restoration but also um, how it's worked, how well, how successful it's been. And in the Pennine Peat Life project, um, we used a number of uh, new techniques, two of which I've just mentioned, the coir logs and the peat buns. So you're going to see a little bit more about that as well in the video. So um, the final thing I guess I've got to say is that it's been intense. The last few years of my life have been very intense, but unbelievably rewarding as well. It's just so gratifying to see these peatlands slowly coming back to life. Um, it really, I can't describe it enough. It's just, it's fantastic. So thank you all for watching. Um, don't run away. I'm now going to try and negotiate my technical skills again and see whether I can actually um, get the video going for you. All our sites are subjected to very extreme weather conditions that not only create and perpetuate the damage of these very degraded sites, but also when coupled with the lack of vegetation cover, and an intact hydrological system. They lead to vast amounts of water and sediment coming off the hills and washing into key catchments like the rivers Yore, Nid and Wharf, and polluting key habitats like the Triple SI site of Sema Water. Consequently, restoring the hydrology is a priority and we use all the might of traditional interventions like peat dams, stone dams, and timber dams.
On this site, there's about eight kilometers worth of eroding gullies that are suitable for timber dams. This amounts to about a thousand dams across a hundred hectare area. And amazingly, within days, they're doing their job and beginning to change the hydrology of the site. Well, I think people will be firstly surprised at the amount of water that's actually held up here. Obviously, the amount of rain that's, that's coming down and the water that's held villages and small towns that don't have the area to hold it. Floodplains just, if you don't hold it up here, you can't stop it when it gets down downhill. So these timber dams that we're building should have, hopefully hold off quite a lot of the water and uh, stop flooding downstream. Back on Fleet Moss, further hydrological measures include the placement of 617 stone dams or stone buns. Again, these are already proving their worth, slowing the flow of water and collecting significant quantities of PT sediment. So in addition to the traditional interventions, we've also used a lot of coir logs. We've mainly used them on flat bare peat areas and also in shallower gullies just to do the same thing, slow the flow and collect sediment and allow that vegetation to come back. And I have to say, they've been a revelation. Positioned to slow down the runoff over the surface to enable the return of vegetation, we're also experimenting with the logs as a way to protect the base of deeper, wider gullies from being constantly undercut by the channels beneath them. Over the two years since they were put in, they've certainly proved their worth, as well as slowing the flow, substantial amounts of sediment have been collected and slowly the cotton grasses and mosses have begun to take root, filling in the brown with an encouraging shade of green. So while I really, really love coir logs, I think that if I was to give an award to the best newcomer in the uplands, I think it would have to go to the peat bund. The peat buns are modelled on lowland style buns adapted to work in upland gullies like this one, that are peat-based and often vegetated, but that are clearly still channeling a great deal of flow. Constructed in a similar fashion to peat dams, it's often surprising how much water they hold back. But when keyed into the sides and built to the correct standard, they work instantly to stop the flow of water and sediment from damaging the catchment area below. The bund being built here now looks like this. It forms part of a network of buns and dams that have transformed this landscape. The buns we've installed range from about three meters wide to about five meters. And two years down the line, they're all still successfully holding back water and are filling with sphagnum and cotton grasses. They're also a great sanctuary for insects. A big event at the start of the year was the cutting and preparation of 3,100 bags of moss-rich brash for flying out onto the 145 hectares of Fleet Moss and Blaybury Moor. We've even got some dwarf shrubs in here. There's a bit of bit of bilberry. So yeah, really important that it isn't just sort of leggy heather, but that we have this really lovely moist content. Just phenomenal though, isn't it? The amount there is. Once the preparation is over, the helicopter is on hand to fly out the bags onto site.
so here I am the morning after the brash has been put out onto Fleet Moss. I feel like this is a really historic moment. This is the site that kicked off the Yorkshire Peak Partnership just over 10 years ago now. And here I am standing in the middle of 2,100 brash bags, all waiting to be spread out. Ooh, it is actually quite emotional. I feel it really is significant. Next, specialist equipment allows the lime to be spread by helicopter. This will reduce the acidity of the peat, helping vegetation to establish. Then the hard work of brushing begins carefully spreading each bag to cover the 10 hectares of bare peat that are impacting these sites. Several days later, and Blaybury Moor has gone from this to this. Over 10,000 coir logs have been installed across both these sites. 10 hectares of bare peat have either been covered with turves or moss-rich Heather brash. On Blaybury Moor, nearly 10 kilometres of hag and gully sides have been reprofiled, with two kilometres being dammed with sturdy peat buns. Now that we're nearing the end of our project, it's great to see these sites are now dotted with small pools sitting behind dams and buns, sediment building behind them slowly re-wetting and greening this broken landscape and better protecting the area's catchments. Critically, it's hoped these areas will help create the resilience peatlands and their inhabitants will need as our climate continues to change.